Okay. okay. Yes, it was good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, and she will give us a presentation on interpretable embeddings from molecular simulations using Gaussian mixture variational vault encoders. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Yasin Moskut Varol Ganesh from Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Mize, and I'm a postdoc there. Um, so, as Oops. okay, let me try again. Yes, it works now. Uh, as we have seen. Uh, molecular dynamic simulations is one of the areas that can most benefit from the developments in the unsupervised machine learning, I would say. Uh, and I would like to motivate with the classical time scale problem here. Uh, we are uh, okay. Oops. That's something. We are here ish nowadays, and we always want to sample the longer time scales, and there are a bunch of methods that allow sampling this region more effectively. And one of the methods is the collective variable biasing. So the idea is picking some direction and applying uh, a potential along this direction and accelerate the sampling this way. Uh, but this requires uh, good selection of CVs beforehand. And what's considered as a good CV is that that allows crossing over the free energy barriers and also separates metastable states and therefore characterizes the slow motions and hence help build kinetic models. Um, the common choices are some internal angles, pairwise distances as coordination numbers are, and also non-generic highly system dependent and highly complex descriptions of the system. And a good CV is not only helpful in altering the dynamics in a controlled manner, but also for interpretation purposes. Uh, for instance, like uh, when building kinetic models, such as Markov models. Um, and so in this free energy plot that you are seeing this uh, darker colors are uh, low free energy regions, hence dense regions. And our aim is to properly locate this high energy barriers also in the low dimensional space so that uh, we can preserve this metastability structure. Uh, and then we take one step further and build a, hopefully build a kinetic model and define or describe the rate of the transition between these metastable states. Uh, uh, but this, as I said, this requires picking a good CV be beforehand, and which is a difficult task, and maybe data-driven techniques can help us to choose one beforehand. So as we have seen, autoencoders are, uh, along with other dimensionality reduction techniques, autoencoders, uh, which are special type of neural networks, offer an easier route for such tasks and with their special ball type shape, fewer nodes in the bottleneck layer uh, forces the network to learn the essence of the data and discard the irrelevant information basically. And the loss function is uh, the discrepancy between the input and the reconstructed version or decoded version of the input basically. Uh, so, uh, oops. Here uh, and there is another flavor of autoencoders, which are called the variational autoencoders, which is just a probabilistic spin to standard autoencoders. And the idea is instead of just learning a mapping from high-dimensional space to low-dimensional space, now the idea is uh, enforce and also infer the parameters of a distribution uh, of the data in the latent space. So they learn to model the data with structure, in a sense. Um, so now we are interested in finding the posterior distribution, meaning the posterior distribution, meaning the probability distribution of the latent variable uh, Z, given the input X. 
Um, and it turns out that this calculation is uh, not easy because of the interactability of the evidence. And what is done is uh, what's called variational inference, hence the name variational autoencoders. So instead of calculating the true posterior, uh, approximating the posterior with an easy to sample or let's say tractable distributions. So this makes the problem as an actually an optimization problem where now we are trying to minimize the KL divergence between the true posterior and the approximate posteriors. And with some manipulations, this can be written as a difference of two terms, uh, where the first one is the one that pushes the latent space to the chosen prior and acts as a regularization. And the other one is trying to uh, maximize the reconstruction uh, uh, likelihood of the uh, decoder uh, or minimize the reconstruction error in a sense. And this nicely follows the neural network view as well. So these components correspond to, correspond to each other. And that's nice thing about the variational autoencoders is that when the prior distribution is chosen as a Gaussian, there is an analytical solution, which makes things a lot easier. Uh, I would say, so. but uh, as I showed, there are two different terms in the loss function now. The first one, the left one you see is uh, when the, this handwritten digits example is trained with the reconstruction loss only, which is just the standard autoencoder. And, uh, and the second plot, the plot in the middle shows that uh, when we only take into consideration the regularization term, which does what it's supposed to do, acts uh, or pushes everything uh, into each other and mixes everything. And when the both terms are considered in the last plot, so we have some sort of separability and also some structure. But if we, our aim is to further cluster these data points in this latent space, this landscape is still not very good for clustering. So the Gaussian prior actually has an anti-clustering effect. So therefore, we suggest replacing the unimodal Gaussian prior with multimodal Gaussian or Gaussian mixture in the latent space so that we can give a space to expand the latent space a little bit more. And so for that, we introduced a categorical variable Y, uh, which can be considered as the cluster ID. So this method allows dimensionality reduction and clustering uh, to, together, basically, that does it simultaneously. Uh, I should say that the number of clusters here is a hyperparameter, but as I will be showing, it acts like an upper bound. So, so this will come, but let's start easy and uh, let's consider the example of 1D for well potential without any dimensionality reduction, um, concentrating just on the clustering. So this is the latent space that we obtained from the Gaussian mixture model, which follows closely to the probability distribution coming from the potential. And this is the accuracy matrix that we obtained by uh, taking the cluster IDs of from the GMBAE method, which is pretty high. And as a comparison, we are also looking at the variation low encoder case and what it does, what was expected from the variation low encoder pushes things a little bit close to each other and making the clustering difficult actually. So it seems like a good improvement, I would say. So the next example is iron dipeptide, which is a benchmark system for conformational dynamics. And it's very well known that the um, metal stable states are lie in this Ramachandran plot. So they have these special names for the metastable states. So, and we use the, the pairwise distances augmented with diagonal angles as feature, uh, as input to the autoencoder and we got this 2D landscape. For interpretation purposes, we always kept the landscape as 2D. And, and these are the cluster IDs. So all, at this point, we noticed an interesting property of the method. Although we trained the method with 10 clusters, we only got six from zero to five. 
and the other clusters were empty. So it, uh, it can be said that um, the method can explore the inherent demand cluster clusters in the system, I would say. So next we looked at the cluster where these clusters are in the Ramachandran plot. So it, it, pretty, it matches pretty well to the metastable state definitions. And then we ne took next step uh, and build the Markov state model using only these six cluster, this course six cluster descriptions. And then the model satisfies the Markovianity and such. So for this example, at least these clusters were uh, appropriate for kinetic purposes, I would say. And other example is now we don't have for this system, uh, no reference kinetic model, or we don't know the number of clusters actually that would uh, be needed in the system. But again, we trained with 10 clusters and this uh, system is 15 residual long peptide. Uh, and this is also a representative system for helix coil transition. And in our simulations, uh, coil state is sampled pretty well and helical and hairpin structures were rare in the system. So what we obtained is, again, this is, we kept the dimensionality as 2D and we got this landscape with this cluster IDs. And as a qualitative analysis, we looked at the structures around the cluster centers. And this suggests that the structures become more and more extended as we go along this direction, basically. And we further validated with more quantitative analysis uh, this shows the average fraction of helic helical helicity, I would say. And as the color goes from blue to red, then the structures become more and more extended, uh, which is in agreement with the quantitative analysis before. And as a further step, we also looked at the distance RMSTs uh, from the reference structure, which we chose as this helical structure which is also in agreement with our previous conclusion. And we, we made another uh, test case uh, on the polystyrene, which is this material that we are seeing every day from computer packaging to food packaging, basically. And it has an interesting property. It, um, it has polymorphs, meaning that these molecules have uh, there exist two at least two uh, structures with different arrangements uh, with hence different um, properties. So uh, experimentally, these are the known polymorphs, and simulating this transition is extremely difficult. Actually, a PhD student in our group spent a substantial amount of time iterating over the off-the-shelf methods uh, to simulate this transition and finally could obtain a good uh, landscape that characterizes all the crystalline phases. And we, instead we decided to follow a purely data-driven approach. And uh, we used the slatum description as the input and try to get different uh, crystalline phases with our method. And, it seems like it does a pretty good job uh, differentiating different crystalline phases. And as the next step, uh, although my examples were all from molecular dynamic simulations, um, I haven't really exploited the fact that our data is a time series data basically and connected in time. So a trick that can be done is just instead of trying to predict uh, the original input, uh, I, the idea is predicting a time-like version of the input, which brings sort of uh, smoothness to the latent space and some dynamical connectivity. So we tried that with this V-shaped potential system. And when we don't add any time-like to the system, the division boundary is around this line. But magically, when we add the time-like, so it perfectly identifies the different clusters. So at least for this system, time lag helps separate the clusters. So this, this is something that one can 
always incorporate when working with the time series data, I would say. So overall, uh, I introduced a method, um, Gaussian mixture variation autoencoder, which helps promoting uh, the separation of metastable states uh, for our applications at least, and it does it simultaneously dimensional reduction and clustering. So it is a generic method, so feel free to adapt to your cases as well. Although I just mm, focused on the molecular dynamics data. So the paper is here and also the, our implementation is there. And I would like to thank my collaborators, Tristan Barrow and Joseph Rutsunski and Atri Banerji from Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research. And thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. We have time for a very quick question over there. Thank you, very nice work. Um, so from what I understand, the, to get the collective variables in this way, you need a very long MD trajectory to begin with. Can you also kind of uh, somehow iteratively explore, like use that collective variable to sample more, or do you always need to have exhaustively sampled the cities before you can get the variables? We haven't specifically tried that, but uh, yeah, that's a good idea. One can, one can of course, do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one round of applause again. Thanks. Thanks.